Hey everybody, welcome to the Kid Contractor Podcast. Welcome to the show. Uh, today we have the epic Craig Scheller with us, Scheller Outdoor Living. Craig, how you doing, man? Good. Epic, huh? Wow. Epic. I thought I figured that was uh, that was uh, suitable for today. You're doing some great stuff. I mean, you're um, Scheller Outdoor doing some awesome install work there and some uh, really cool high end uh, landscape and primarily hardscape projects. I mean, your focus is pretty much hardscape now, right? Uh, so our, our focus is uh, outdoor construction company. So we, uh, we basically GC the backyard. So somebody comes to us and has a blank slate or they have a redo. Then we go to them and we say, uh, basically our ideal client will want us to take it from design to jumping in the pool. Nothing else needs to be done. Uh, similar to the way you would build a house or something like that. So, I have a GC license, so we can take. You know, we we do all the permitting. We take the, we get the. We have electrician. We have a fence guy. We have. You know, we work with irrigation companies. Uh, we we try to basically take all the pressure off the homeowner. So, um, all the upfront work is done, and then all the work is done, and then we hand them a yard, a backyard that's complete. You know, at the end of the process. So, our ideal co- customer really wants us to do everything, including carpentry. That's awesome. That. So yeah. So it's because it's created a really good niche for us. So, right. Where, where does your, where do your ideal clients and when did you find out Craig, what your ideal client is and, and how do you target them or what, what does that look like? Well, I think, uh, it was kind of a, you know, you know, I've been back in it about two and a half years and I, I knew when I started, then I was going to start doing fiberglass pools and that just getting that process going. So we did a couple of pools that were either for another contractor or for, uh, we did a smaller one where there wasn't much going on, but it was a good way for us to get in. But what I realized when we did the one with the contractor was that it took forever because we were waiting on other trades. And it's kind of similar to how uh, hardscapers get tired of waiting on pool guys. You know, pool guys kind of get tired of waiting. Like we were waiting for coping so we could do the auto cover. And it's like all these different moving parts. And mm-hmm. just with my background of years of doing excavation and uh, some utility work and remodeling and carpentry and hardscape and all this, I just felt like I should be able to take this process on. And in a county that we work in, uh, in on the Kansas side, it requires a GC license to do pools. Um, so I went ahead and did that. And uh, so I have a class C residential. And then I just started seeing the like people when I'd go, by the time I'd get to somebody and meet them, they'd be like, yeah, we talked to a pool guy, we talked to a hardscape guy, we talked to a landscaper. No, nobody will design or plan the whole thing. It's kind of a, you know, it's like, or they're either calling the wrong people or there's just not, there's a bigger demand for this niche than I realized. So I was mm-hmm. just like, well, we can just take it all on for you. Like we'll handle the drainage. We'll ha- like, we, we understand how everything works. So it just makes sense for us to kind of uh, be in charge of the whole process. And then, you know, that way everything's done timely and correctly and all that. And it allows us to, you know, if we're waiting on something on a certain aspect of the project, it allows us to move to another aspect of the project and do that work and not be like moving back and forth between projects. So uh, that helps as well. So we can kind of stay on one project for two to three months. Yeah. Now, folks, if, uh, we, we've had another at least one other episode with Craig here on uh, Kid Contractor. And uh, I'll try to maybe remember to dig up that episode and put it in the show notes here if you want to get a little more context or background on on Craig. But I, I wanted to try to, to dig a little even deeper than we got last time or get, you know, just more, more about Scheller here. And, um, how do you, how do you, so something I've been, I, I always think I feel, I always feel like I have this figured out to some extent and then just things change and I don't get jobs I thought we had. And, you know, and then the jobs I'm like, they're never going to contract with us. And then sure enough, okay, sounds right. good. You know, this <laughs> yeah. flipping the script on me and how do you, how do you screen your clients? How do you, how do you figure out who you're going to talk to and, and, and what does that look like when you're, you decide you're really going to give them a lot of effort to begin to put a project together or meet with them and all that back and forth that is residential design build? So the best client for me right now I'm finding is somebody that's obviously referred to us by somebody we've done a similar project to um, or for. And then if they're following us on Instagram. Uh, and I, the reason I say that is because I just we had we had our current client refer us to someone uh, we went to meet with them regarding their project. Uh, the client, our client had already said, Hey, there's a design fee. There's a process like he, like I got there to do my spiel and they're like, Oh yeah, we know. 
you know, it's like, yeah, awesome. like I didn't, I, I didn't even know what to say because I hadn't, you know, hadn't really done, I, I kind of shut down doing meetings for a while because we got booked really fast last year. Um, and I, I, I kind of slowly letting things progress. Like we just sold another pool. Uh, we, we're doing, we're, we're in design on this one I was just talking about, but I guess the, the ideal client for us is going to be somebody that, um, you know, first of all, if they weren't referred, I, I always give them the process on the phone. And I had, I had a situation like this a couple weeks ago, somebody called, um, and they're like, uh, I, I started having this, having this conversation and they were like, yeah, we just fired a concrete guy. He did a horrible job. We just built this house. We need a deck. We need a patio. We need a pool. We need some uh, grading done. We need, we want to build a pond and we, you know, all these different things. I'm like, well, this sounds like a perfect opportunity for us because we can come in and either handle all of these things in house or, uh, work from our pool of contractors that we work with to get the project done for you and take it off your hands. Mm -hmm. And she's like, okay. And I gave her, you know, it's this much for a consultation. Typically it's this much for a design. And then she's like, Oh, it's going to cost me $1,600 or whatever before I even know what the price is going to be. And I'm like, yeah, I can't give you an accurate measure or accurate quote without knowing exactly what we have to do. And that requires the consultation side analysis, uh, the design. Um, she goes, well, this guy said he could do a pool for this much. And this guy said he'd do the concrete for this much. And I was like, well, good for them. I said, I don't have anything to go off of except for the phone call we're on right now. So she, uh, I said, are you, I said, where'd you find us? She said on Instagram. And I said, are you, I guess you're following us then? She goes, no, my daughter is hmm. I was like, well, I'd encourage you to go see what we're doing because you know, that kind of tells the story of how our, our company works and the type of projects we do and the type, type of, uh, quality we want to have. And, and I don't, I would assume you wouldn't fire us at the end. So it was funny because we went through this process and she goes, instead of me like begging for an appointment and saying, Oh, I'll, never mind, I'll, I'll waive the consultation. She goes, I'll put you on a maybe list. And I was like, sounds good. Yeah. Or no, <laughs> so, yeah I'm, I'm not going to lose sleep over that one because it sounds right. like, you know, she's looking for the cheapest price on every little aspect of the project. I wonder why so, they, that's the same one that had to fire a couple other contractors. Is that right, right. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Man, I'm, I wonder if there's a pattern here at <laughs> yeah. all. We, we don't so, learn from yeah. our patterns, I guess. Right. So you learn, you try to read the red flags on the phone. <laughs> I always screen everything on the phone and get as much information as possible. What, and, uh, what are other red flags for you? Kisses of death, if you will, on a project or when in that stage. Well, any, anytime somebody says they don't want to pay for consultation, I just hang, I just say, well, we're not a good fit because if, if you won't spend a hundred and hundred to $150, uh, for my time, uh, on a project that's going to be, you know, two to $300,000, I don't feel like that's a good, right. you know, <laughs> that's it. Or even a $70,000 job or $50,000 job or whatever. It doesn't really matter. I think that if you're not willing to value what we do and what we offer as a company, then I, I don't think it's worth any either of our time and you might as well call and get your three or four bids. Uh, that's mm -hmm. kind of how I see it at this point. Um, I'm also not, you know, I, I, I don't want to sound like, like I'm above everybody. I just, I'm not starving for work right now because we've set up larger projects that are going to take us forever. So mm -hmm. I can be really picky. I'm not trying to fill a whole summer. It's already done. Like, um, so that's, I mean, that's the benefit to these projects. Um, but also like if, if they say I got a bid from this guy and it was this much. And, and so that's a red flag to me, or, uh, honestly, the, the first red flag I get is, yeah, we're calling and getting three or four estimates. Usually when I have a sole job, they're calling me and that's it. And yeah. I think you can get to that. You can get to that level by having good referral partners, taking care of your clients and having them spread the word about you. You know, every, every job that we've gotten over the last year or whatever is, is a referral. And when I get there, I feel like it's pretty much sold or, you know, it's just a few details to work out. So I think that's kind of, um, I don't know what, uh, I don't exactly know what other red flags there are, but, uh, uh, it's usually it's, if they're, if they're shopping, you know, I, that's when I start really doing the, the, the phone call, uh, screening and asking my questions, I guess. What, and for, for the, I get, I get asked a lot as I'm sure you do too, by other contractors, young contractors, kid contractors, if you will, on, on Instagram, uh, the young contractor out there tr asking the questions, essentially alluding to how do we get, how do, how do I get to this stage of business? Like you're talking about where you can be confident in turning away work and 
really kind of drawn a line in the sand of the type of work you do and you don't stray from that at all and the type of client you're looking for. What do you what do you say that 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 process over a career, let's say, looks like from how many years in and experience background and and that's a question with a lot of onion layers. <laughs> Like yeah. what, what's your interpretation of that? How, how do you, how would you answer that? So I'll go back to my, you know, my prior contracting business where I did a similar thing. Uh, and that, that was, I was, as an owner operator and somebody that's in the field a lot, I don't have a lot of time to go chase quotes. And what I was finding is, you know, we, we were, we were in a good place on Google in that company. It was kind of before Google like ramped up with having to pay and having to get positioned. I just did some keywords. And like, if you searched, you know, hardscape or landscape in the like Kansas City North or something, somehow I worded something just right to where like, yeah, we found you on Google. Yeah, we found you on Google. We found you on Google. You know, like, and I found I kept chasing those. So Google's great, but if you have, you need to have a really good like screening process for those because those are typically window shoppers. Um, so I, I got into the point where I felt like, man, I'm going to do like, you know, I get there. You know, I'd waste an hour of time to, away from the, you know, because it's either during, during the day or at night or on the weekend and you're you're chasing all these things and you get there and like, oh, yeah, this is probably going to run, you know, 25 grand or something. And they're like, oh, you know, we were thinking maybe $5,000. Well, not only be I wasted my time, but I <laughs> I just wasted their time. Right. Uh, so I what I started doing was if they found me on Google, I had pictures I, I updated frequently my pictures on my website which i don't even do this now I, i'm terrible at this part now just because i don't necessarily work off my website as much but um i had every picture memorized and i'd say oh you found me on google uh you've been to my website uh what's the picture on there that you like like what are you like what picture speaks to you and says this looks like my backyard or something similar and and they would say oh we like this one where it has kind of a circle area and a fire pit and then a patio and or we like the grill island or, you know, whatever. And I said, okay, that, that typically, that project typically runs, you know, 20 to $30,000. And then you get, okay, well, that's about what we were thinking. Oh, uh, okay. I'll set up an appointment. Let's talk about this further, get the design process going. Or if they are that person I visited that said, oh, we were thinking 5,000, we could get that done. Or this guy said he could do it for 12. And I'm like, well, I would probably call that guy. I actually did this a couple of times. I was like, go ahead and call that guy. If he does a great job, let me know. And I'll use him as a sub. Because <laughs> <laughs> uh sounds like I could make some money off this guy. Yeah, really, right? Yeah, there's there's yeah. margin there, huh? <laughs> <laughs> the, so that was kind of that was kind of where I started that. And that was I, you just have to be like there there's something about um I think this is a real challenge in the industry, but there's really something about having confidence as a business owner and having confidence in what you offer as a service. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I was talking to somebody about this. It's like it, you have, we have, I was actually, I was speaking. That's what it was. I was speaking at a deal in Omaha and somebody asked me, how do you, how do you get away from like running all these samples to people and then doing all this legwork? And then they say, Oh, we're going to go with somebody else. And I said, well, I would, I would start with ch charging a consultation fee and I would start with, you know, having some value to what you, you know, offer to somebody, even in the planning process and don't run samples, you know, have them come to you and look at samples or meet you at the dealer, like make, make them invest it a little bit, you know? Yeah. And I think that's where, you know, I, you know, the, the analogy I used was like, if you, if you call a plumber or electrician or some kind of trade, you're going to pay a service fee before they even tell you what's wrong with your, with your house. You know, um, if you're going to build a house, you have to buy the plans. You have to put a deposit down with the builder to secure the land. Like there's so many things we could be comparing ourselves to instead of just being guys that show up mm. and, and we're like giving stuff away all the time. And I, I, I personally am just, I, I think I offer way too much to do that, you know, yeah. And if somebody refers me, I'll sometimes waive that consultation because I feel like it's, it's kind of a, a done deal. Um, and, and we can, we can start now giving people see what we're doing on Instagram. They're following us before they hire us. They're following us while we're in the process. Uh, and they're, and they're being referred by people that are doing a similar project. So I don't know if the money aspect is shared between those people, 
but when I give budgets now, it's like expected, you know, like, well, we, that's a little bit more than we were wanting, but we understand, you know, we're seeing the process. Like you can really tell, and that's why I'm, I'm trying to be more active with showing what we're doing because you can really tell the story of what you're providing mm. through your stories and things like that on a daily basis. Yeah. Telling the story is a, is something I'm, I'm realizing, uh, is a, a bigger deal than I thought it was and gave it, gave credence to. And even one thing with our shop here, our, our office and facility that we've built here, um, is we've had a handful of people visit us, uh, that are looking for projects, actually find us on Google and actually come to the facility. That's not what we intended to happen. We've had three of those projects come, uh, come our way. And, you know, this is kind of a side tangent of that, but it's, they see the facility and it's, it's a deal, um, it's a deal maker in its own right, right? Yeah, They're sure. you guys are a professional outfit, you know, they've got a nice office and a facility and all that. And then they see the work, whatever that is they're looking to do. It really is something that helps seal the deal and telling the story. And now I didn't used to want anybody local following us on Instagram or YouTube <laughs> yeah. or anything like that. I put way too much of my own yeah. personal stuff out there. I just don't want that local. But now I'm starting to realize the, like you're saying, and especially when I tell folks, mostly local folks, I'm saying, go check out our YouTube channel because that's, that's not as Caleb is a crazy person nuance on Instagram person, yeah. you know, necessarily, but YouTube's and, and that, so yeah, it's, in, and that helps seal, you know, the deal because the, the Instagram or the YouTube thing is a lot of uh, just, just more equipment and like you're saying process of how we build and, and the, right. the philosophy of, of construction projects and stuff like that. And that, that's been a bit, that's been actually a, a great selling point or, or a kind of clincher for us, which I, I didn't exactly, I've always heard people say that you should put that kind of stuff out there for that, um, you know, on, on websites and, and things like that. And it, I'm seeing it happen like you are here. Uh, Craig, what this is in this, in this iteration of Sheller Outdoor, how long, how long is this, this, cause you had, I guess to give more context, you've got this company now, you, you were self-employed prior to this and then went back into the industry to, to, um, uh, to work employee status, I guess. I don't, you tell, to give us a, a oh, yeah, I can give you a brief. Yeah. yeah. So I, I started out of high school doing lawn care and landscaping. This uh, 90, 1997 is when I graduated. Uh, so I'm an old guy. Been around you a long say, time. You know, I was, <laughs> I was at the doctor the other day, actually skin doctor, and I've got some stuff on the side of my head that needs burn off and all that. So kids and everybody out there, wear sunscreen, wear wide broom hats, take care of your skin because yeah. i got to get some gnarly treatment on the side of my head here to get some precancerous crap taken off of. So the reason I say that, folks, take care of your skin, my gosh. Yeah. Anyways, because I'm not looking forward to what i got to do to the side of my head here. So um, that being said, the girl at the desk, um, there's a FedEx guy next to me. And he needed her signature and there was some medicine or something. He had to give her, she had to give her birth date. And she, she's like two twenty three ninety seven. And I'm like, Oh my heavens. I started my company in 99. Like, my, <laughs> Oh God, I'm getting old, man. Holy crap. You know? So yeah. it's, yeah, it's, it's weird getting old, Craig. But anyways, yeah. I cut you off there to, to share that, okay. that bit of a uh, understanding with you. <laughs> so, yeah. So that was Craig's lawn care. I actually, I'm, I'm a serial entrepreneur. Uh, I think we have a lot more things in common based on your story. We could probably share about I'm over sorry. the years. And I have a great, <laughs> I have a, I have a fantastic wife that's uh, trying to straighten me out. Hey, um, and so anyway, that was a, that business well lasted four years. It was a complete disaster. Uh, it, you know, it, it taught me a lot. I learned a lot. Uh, and then I went into like construction. I, I framed houses, I worked for some other landscape companies. Um, you know, I, I was, it was, it was kind of fun to learn how to frame and, and do carpentry type stuff. And then, um, in 2008, I started a Sheller lawn and landscape. So we did maintenance. So I, I have a full spectrum of, we did applications, mowing, spring and fall cleanups, uh, hardscape. And then we really focused and we kind of, uh, we, we sold off all the maintenance equipment, sold off some accounts and focused on hardscape in like 2010 or 11. And that's where my passion kind of really started for the hardscape industry. Uh, in 2015, uh, I was, I was, it kind of burned out because it was kind of one of those things where I had started the business going, uh, we need to take care of our vendors and our employees, and then we'll figure out what's left over not really knowing our numbers and, mm. and all that. So it was, it was really, we were doing well, we were doing good projects. The cash flow was there. Every winter was a struggle, you know, um, we had, 
we were probably heavy on employees for in some things. Uh, you know, I'm, I've learned a lot through that. And then went to work for a local distributor as a hardscape sales rep. Uh, they were purchased by Site One, and then I worked with Site One for about a year and a half after that. So about three years in distribution, and then two and a half years as a, a manufacturer rep for Mirage, which is a porcelain tile manufacturer. And we I helped cover the like outdoor tile uh, uh, over the central U.S. So um, came out to Ohio a few times, uh, visited Semco and Site One's out there and all that. So um, covered that Midwest area basically. And then 2020 is when I started. It was kind of during COVID. I was doing a lot of uh, basement office work, Zoom calls, and you know, couldn't travel and and all that stuff. And I kind of realized I needed to be back home. And it seemed like the contracting business was booming. And I, I kind of always told myself I wasn't going to get back into it, but had a conversation with my wife and said, I feel like you know this is probably the only way that I can make a decent living and be at home and not traveling, you know, in the industry without going to work for somebody else, I guess. And, uh, uh, she, she allowed it. And, uh, <laughs> so we had a good conversation, but I'm, I'm, uh, the difference now is I'm paying myself first. I paid myself from the beginning mm. and it's helped me hire a little bit slower and, you know, focus more on equipment and efficiencies and things like that. So. Yeah. yeah. And I'm glad you, you came to that point. Cause I was going to ask, you know, what does, uh, hey, I, I, I got to see some video or picture. I can't picture you on a zero turn mower or <laughs> I just can't picture it, man. I just, I only know you as hardscape sheller. So, so yeah, I lay down, I lay down stripes on my own yard every week. So I'll start oh, showing man. those. Yeah. I'll start tagging you in my mowing. <laughs> Stripe nation out there. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, well, Craig, what, so what is, what is the, the, let's say asset inventory look like at Sheller with equipment and trucks? Like what, what do you have big picture that get, allows you to complete, Two hundred and three hundred thousand dollar project, like that's not so. Uh, well, um, let's see. So we have a eight ton excavator with a tilt rotator. Uh, we just finalized the purchase thanks to Jeremy and all these tech technology guys. We just uh, we just got a rover and a oh cool GPS, the GPS setup for the excavator. So nice. we're going to start modeling our projects and digging using three D GPS. Oh, that's awesome. Um, yeah, it's it's really exciting. We're actually getting uh, trained tomorrow on the rover. So, And that's Jeremy uh, Swihart, J-Squared Outdoor. They're doing next yeah, level yeah. hard stuff. <laughs> right um, yeah, it just, and it, we, uh, it was a, con it was, it started for him back, I, we had, actually, I just had him on my podcast and we were talking about this stuff. So it'll, it'll be coming out. But like the, uh, it's funny because you, you look for things that are like, can I, should I hire one more person for the year or should I buy something else? And, and I, I always take it to the guys and I'm like, Hey, I'm thinking about this. I think this would make a huge difference in what we do. We're always fighting string lines and paint lines and trying to repaint and stakes and lasers and, and setting all this. We spend so much time laying out projects. I was like, what do you guys think of this? Go see what Jeremy's doing. And we use Leica. We, it's, uh, it's another brand other than Trimble. Uh, but they have the system to where we can do a rover. We can actually build a model in the field with a rover, take the screen off the rover, stick it in the machine, and we're placed in the project basically and can dig. But we're going to take it to another level where we do topos and site analysis. Our designer will lay over that. We'll send that to Leica. They'll make a model for us. We'll put that in the machine. We'll show up on the project. The excavator will be in the middle of the backyard. That's so in the awesome. design. Yeah, we'll dig without a string line. We'll have all our dig specs in. We'll have it's it's going to be it's going to be unreal. I don't even think I can comprehend what it's going to do for us. Yeah, that's. Um, but we do a lot of elevation changes and walls, and I think it's just going to make a huge difference in how we lay out our projects and and efficiencies. Um, what would, so, what would you say? What is the smallest design build company or project size or style that that would make the most sense for as all that stuff costs right now? Would you say like what what company would that make sense for smallest? Well, company? And this is kind of what we chatted about was like. It, it kind of is like. I don't know that I wouldn't do this if I was doing the patio every other week. Nice. You know, cool. because what how much think about how much time you spend pulling tape measures and repainting right. lines and you paint it on the grass and then you dig it and then you got to paint it again. And then you're, you know, you get your laser out and you're doing your elevation on the gravel and you're, then you got to 
guess on your radius cuts and like you can create a radius with this and and like that's what jeremy's doing he's he cut a whole patio using the rover yeah you know he basically went around and made all the points on the patio so it's it's designed it's build as designed you know without you know too much craziness so and, and the rover folks is and help me craig if i'm wrong is essentially a what looks like a broom pole with a frisbee on top of it <laughs> and yeah. you walk yeah. around and you you collect and you push a button and it collects the data points from every place that thing is elevation distance from a like a like a home uh benchmark maybe yeah it's amazing it's seriously next level and it's going to be the new standard eventually like i believe um you know you're a steel wrist ambassador on the tilt rotator end of things there and uh, I, th I think that is someone had likened it to, and I think it was the steel wrist guys was likening tilt rotators in North America. It's a wave that's about to crash on North America. I think it's finally yeah. like hit. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a pinnacle of acceptance. I think it's really about to be like, that is the new standard of excavators. Um, yep. I think so. To have a tilt rotator on it. And so the next thing then that I think is like tilt rotator 2019 is this rover tremble like a you name your brand uh data yeah. capture because that that is the that is one of the biggest friction points so far as i know in my business right now is data capture on a job site and yeah. just going out and getting all the information and just having to figure out how a job lays out and then mapping it like you're saying so you know i think swihart has got a couple of videos up on his youtube channel explaining it better but um well, we're going to, we're going to take, and I think Jeremy's doing this too, but we're going to take this to a, a different, like we, as we got it, like, as they demoed it for us and then we, we started talking about it and like, oh, we could do this, this, and this, like we, he, he, when he demoed, we were doing the gravel base around the pool on the project we're on now. And he went around a certain area of the patio and said, you need seven yards of gravel to get this up to elevation. Oh my heavens. Yeah. And then we had a gravel pile sitting you know, yeah, there's no reason it couldn't be volumetric calculations. For oh, it you. actually does. Yeah. So you can go to your gravel pile and say, go around the base of the pile and then do it like the top of the, you know, or get, you yeah. know, you can do, you can get as much elevation to detail as you want. Like if there's a dip in it, take a pick, you know, get all that stuff. It'll tell you, you know, you have eight yards. Okay, we're good. Or you have five and you need to go grab two more. Like there's so many things. The other thing is like we we're always running gas lines, electrical lines, pool lines. We're gonna do we're gonna oh, do yeah, as built cool. we're gonna do as built and show how deep the pipes are where the pipes are located oh, on the property. So cool. You're, you could do irrigation system like it's when you start thinking about like oh yes it's a big investment trust me it's it's about the same as hiring a guy for the year though. Like well, that's what I was gonna you, ask about sharing and, exactly you, and that's sure. not gonna be and that's if and that's if that guy's not trained to help you right. lay out all these projects and then you take into consideration the safety aspect of not having somebody on the ground. I can go dig these pools and. Uh, site prep by myself yeah or if we hire an operator or if we sent, train one of our guys to go do it and then we're we're finishing up something instead of oh we need everybody to go set it up like there's just a lot of i looked at the the bigger picture of it and i was just like this completely makes sense for what we're doing but other than other than that we do have a, a full size skid steer uh, kubota 97 uh, we went a little bit we went to the bigger end of the skid steer because we have a 1550 ditch witch so they complement each other well. And then uh, our we have a single axle international, so 30, 33,000, uh, so it's a bigger one. Uh, air brake trailer, like we kind of, I've kind of gone big, you know. Yeah, awesome. And the tri-axle is part of our business, but it's usually subbed out to other hauling companies. Oh, I'm glad you mentioned time. that. I forgot, I wanted to ask you yeah. about that. Uh, but you, we you will have... use that some for our projects to haul off and bring in stuff. You have CDLs, Craig? Commercial driver's license? I, I do. I have a class A and then I our obviously our dump truck driver has a class A and then uh, our main uh, full-time guy has a permit. So we're working on getting him a uh, class A as well. Nice. On that Rover, would you, would you just for folks wondering, I don't need an exact cost unless you want to share it, uh, budgeting to start a $30,000 budget to, to begin that, or are we talking even higher 50? I 60? think, so. well, I think there's, le it, no, it's less than that actually. Um, it depends on the, like there's different ones. You can get one that is not tilt compensating. So like, that means you can, you have, right. there's a bu level bu bubble on it and you have to get that thing level and then accept the measurement. Uh, we got one that has tilt compensation to like 25 degrees. So I, I feel like that's a pretty good, like you can run around and take a, you know, take a shot and wait half a second or whatever. And then, um, it's, and that one doesn't have to be perfectly level. So I did that one so we could capture things faster, uh, sure. especially, especially on doing like the topos and stuff. And then 
they have one that was more expensive that you can do like um, 75 degrees or 70 degrees. I mean, the guy laid it on the ground and was collecting within a hundredth of an inch. Like it was unbelievable. That's insane. So, um, but then like what's, what gets more expensive is like, like we went with a little bit bigger tablet just for display because we're using it in the machine. Right. Uh, there's, you know, if you use their network, we have a free network in Missouri with the DOT. Um, so that's something we're going to log into. Uh, hmm. So for the GPS and satellite stuff. And then no um, I think Ohio might even have that. You might research that. No kidding. Uh, so, and then ask, ask uh, Jeremy. And so there's different levels you can get, but like we, it was going to be about, uh, I want to say in the $20,000 range just for the Rover and that kind of setup. Oh, that's not depends on what you're, Yeah. But then we're adding it to the machine as well. So we'll have two Rovers on the machine. Uh, it'll all be tied into our 2D dig assist like sensors that we have. This is, I think, where Leica and Trimble differ. Le Trimble might actually have a lower entry rate. We just have really good support with Leica here, so that's right. the way I went. And we already have the system on our machine for 2D, so it was just kind of one of those. It just made sense. But and they have it to where I don't have to take. So Trimble, I think you can take the rover off the stick and put it on your machine, and then they'll have sensors that you can actually just use that. It's becoming very like it's it, they're setting up for smaller businesses to do these kind of things or smaller companies. It's not just for big, you know, highways and, you know, neighborhoods and, you know, uh, development type stuff. They're, they're making it a lot. So the, the lower, um, lower entry level, I guess, for like yeah. getting into smaller companies to do it. So there's different levels of it. It's kind of where your comfort level is. It made sense for me to kind of go all out by the time I looked at the difference in price to, you know, use the rover and still paint and still make stakes and do all that. I, I was like, I might as well just stick it on the machine because I have the machine already halfway set up. So yeah, that's amazing, man. That is so cool. And yeah. that that, that kind of brings me to, I was going to ask what in what what that checked off, right? I was going to ask what innovations are you seeing in the in the industry, and then the follow up to that is like, where do you see the industry, hardscape, green industry in general? still lagging behind. So that stuff, like I think the next level contractors like you and Swihart and Dirt Ninja, and I'm forgetting a bunch of, I think Mulder's getting in on that. Like uh, there's a bunch of guys really adapting to that stuff. But what what else do you see coming down the the, the, the pike as my old uh, grandpa used to say? Um, what, what do you see? Anything else you think is just, we're not here, you know, it's still Tilt Rotator 2019. That's right now, like uh, that's still a little bit further down with the stuff that's going to, Anything out there you're seeing that you're like, this will be big in like five years, let's say, or six? Um, no, I think I think one area that we're lagging behind is I think we're still just too scared to get CDLs. Um, I mean, I think if you're going to... As an industry, the, as an industry. As, as an industry, yeah. Uh, that's one thing. Like, once I got that, uh, it's, there was so much freedom. I mean, I could... I stopped looking at what truck and trailer combination I could get and still right. stay under CDL. I looked at, like, what truck is going to get us the most benefit and help us be the most efficient, help us haul off our materials, you know, even, even just like a 450 or 550 or having the right trailer behind that. Or, um, I think that, I think it's important to at least have one or two guys that can haul your equipment for you or, or just quit worrying about it and hire somebody to haul your equipment. I mean, that's also another option. So, uh, a lot of times people make decisions based on what they can drive and what they can haul instead of, how can we make this work and just charge our client for it? You know, like have, have the equipment hauled if you need to. Um, but, you know, I saw a lot of, you know, at Con Expo, we, we saw a lot of electric and remote control and autonomous stuff. I don't know how quickly that's going to come. I'd, I'm guessing it's coming. Uh, but I don't know that that's necessarily something that's going to really impact us for a while as far as a small contractor. Uh, I would just say like, don't don't be hesitant to at least research and and maybe demo and and make the phone calls and check out some of these things that you know the technology and the even the tilt rotators you know um, or like I I would say get the you know the way we do it is like is this machine going to work for us for five years that's how I buy a machine you know it's not like what do we need right now you know what can we get by with this moment. You know, and that and that may maybe that's what you're doing in this moment is what your model is for five years from now. So buy what makes sense. But like when I look at it, I have a, a kind of a picture of where my business is going. 
So when I, you know, when I bite the bullet on a triaxle, it's because I have a plan for my business. Um, and it's something like that. I feel like if the plan doesn't come, come away and I need to sell it, that's a sellable machine, you know, um, it's something we can probably unload. Uh, but I feel, I feel pretty confident in the path that I'm taking that, you know, buying an eight ton excavator, buying a skid steer, buying a, the trucks that we have, it's going to, it's going to get us to where we need to be in five years and I don't have to repurchase or, you know, in two years or whatever. So hmm. kind of how I'm trying to look at things a little bit. So, yeah, that, that's, that's uh, awesome, man. And I, you, you know, you mentioned the, getting a larger tablet for the Leica system there. You know, I could see even putting in a, in a job trailer or even on site, a weatherproof television or something where you could run a really big, like 24 by 36 set of plans, if you will. Yeah you know, into there. So you could really zoom in on things and really get a good look at stuff and have meetings in the morning and talk to your team about laying things great. out. Like, right. That's, like, that's, I'm a, sure. that's a great idea. Cause we're just redoing our trailer right now. So, well, there you go. That'd be, <laughs> and be I, and I added power and all kinds of stuff in there. Yeah. Command yeah. central. Yeah. That's super. <laughs> cool, um, so yeah, I, I could definitely see that being a thing. I mean, I did that the other day, just in our, uh, in our office, uh, which is something I've dreamt of doing my whole freaking career so far was like, having a place we could actually have a meeting with the guys and we went over photos of a project. It was a grading, a grading job around a horse barn. Uh, but we went over it and looked at some aerial satellites and some you know, satellite views and things like that of where, and drew on the TV of where we're going to send water and all this stuff. It was really cool. It was like an awesome, uh, I felt like a uh, minority report that movie where, you know, you're moving stuff around and showing people this and that, like it was really <laughs> cool. It was, it was like yeah. awesome to get to do that in the, sh in the shop and office. Finally, like I was just, just pumped what you know you're i'll go this this route here and we're getting it for gosh 40 minutes already um what does um what lessons you know from your previous you know couple companies and then like what lessons carried forward that has really made sheller outdoor currently like i i say success that's a that's a very subjective term of course but yeah. um what what have you what are some things that you've carried forward from past business experiences and even working outside uh you know like you said framing and stuff like that like there's a lot of broad skill set there it's awesome yeah i i think first of all uh i i still don't have it all figured out and we're we're still battling things and i think that's the important thing is like to always stay in a position where you know you can get better and i think that um I still fall short on the business side and that's where I'm really trying to, uh, I'm always trying to pull myself out of the day to day, like install, which is really hard for me because that's my passion, uh, and really let my guys take on some things. And I'm kind of doing it with them knowing and without them knowing, you know, I'm just kind of like, Hey, I got this thing going on or I'm going to go do this or that. And I, I just, I'm trying to find opportunities to leave them to problem solve and, figure things out on the mo their own because I, I feel like I'm a micromanager when I'm on site. I almost slow things down because hmm. I'm always over analyzing or I think, like I said this to Travis this morning, I feel like I think, you know, I need you to think two or three steps ahead. My problem is sometimes I think 10 steps ahead and I just throw the whole thing off, you know, because I need to see a little bit more right now. And, you know, so that, there's just those kind of things. But like, I think the biggest thing that I took from my previous business was uh, my commitment to pay myself first. And that that's, that's becoming, that's all part of that valuing yourself. Uh, and, and when you value yourself from the beginning as the owner of the company, as the foreman, as the project manager, as the admin, you know, like I'm doing four or five, six different, you know, jobs because we're a small company and thinking about what it would cost to hire all those things out, even if they were part-time people. So like, I'm paying myself what I would consider a good salary compared to what a lot of business owners value their, their selves at because I was making a really good living as a sales rep, you know? So for me to come to my wife and say, Hey, let's throw away our health insurance and our paid vacation and me being able to take off on a Friday because I traveled or, uh, and that, that consistent paycheck every two weeks, let's start a business again, you know, and see what's left over, you know, that's not going to work. So, uh, so I basically, started myself at what my base was at my previous job, which was bold. Yeah, like awesome. I said earlier, but what I said earlier, like I said earlier is I've, it's made me think about what I've, every decision I've made in my company and how I hire and if we're ready to hire and if that's going to pull from my family um, or if that's, you know, going to take away from somebody else that's important on our team right now. 
or if that's going to keep us from progressing uh, with our equipment purchases. So like, we're not, we don't have it all figured out and I'm still, you know, I'm the bigger, like one thing with the challenge of the bigger projects is, is cash flows are really challenging. Like you have to be wired. Like, I don't know that I'm wired for it. I, I, it's working so far, but like you have to really be wired for preparation and logistics and curveballs all the time. And uh, like, rain and like everything everything just magnified like we will spend a half a day preparing for rain and it may rain or not rain so like we know that if it rains we can work the following day because we prepared the site for it you know yeah so we take we'll take the extra time to do that kind of stuff like so uh so it's the bigger projects are it's just a whole different animal um and so i i kind of i've kind of fallen into it because i like I like the consistency. I like going to the same place. I don't like moving stuff all the time. But so that's one thing is just the paying myself first and that and valuing myself because that's when I go to my client and I can say, no, you know, I'm basically saying my billable time is this much. You know, if I come see you, I'm not productive. Right. So I have to, I have to charge you because I'm taking away from what I can, what I can provide for my company while I come spend an hour looking at your property. And, and that's the difference between me getting paid or not getting paid or us getting a project done or not getting a project done. So mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm very important to the crew, you know, in some aspects as far as being on site, but I'm also important to the company and other aspects where I need to, you know, take priority in those areas. So for me to go do a, an estimate, I have to know that it's worth it. And I have to know that it's going to be worth my time to go put that effort in. So, because, it doesn't matter if you're doing a three hundred thousand dollar job or a five thousand dollar job. It still takes you three or four hours to consult and estimate the project. So, just think about that. Yeah, that's the worst thing about the little jobs that takes the same amount of logistics and almost back and forth with a client within reason, of course. Yeah. Uh, but you still got to pick out colors, pick out materials and patterns, and and all that. Be it a, a be it a two hundred square foot space or a, a thousand square foot space. Those, all of those details still are at that bottleneck of yep. the information gathering point. Um, let alone still site survey and all that, where you got to go out and still capture all that data. And so you run out there with that Rover Frisbee broomstick thing and, you know, dot all that out. Like how awesome is that for, you know, the plans of just, I just love it, man. Uh, you, Craig, you mentioned, you know, planning and stuff like that and Scheller in five years, what does Scheller look like in five years as of today here? Anno Domini 2023. <laughs> well, um, uh, it, it looks it looks like uh, well, here's what I've laid out for my team, and I, I'll I, I think I've shared this enough that I'm okay with it. But like, um, and I'm I'm pretty much an open book, so you know this is if this stuff helps uh, the industry, that's what I'm all about. And I think where where we're trying to get to, and we're we're actually in the process of, because of the way we've set up our excavator, we're taking steps to get part of this ball rolling this year. Um, but we're, we're looking at being, instead of having 15, 20 employees doing two or three different projects or four different projects or however you want to do it, I'm looking at still remaining lean. Uh, I would say two man crews and have about five of them. Um, two would be uh, the dump truck and the machines doing site prep, excavation, preparing jobs for the pool crew. So then we have a pool crew uh, come by, set the pool. And this may require all, you know, there may be some days where we require like, hey, we need the hardscape crew and the pool crew to come. We're going to set the pool or whatever. Um, and then so we have a pool crew. They do the plumbing, set the pool, get it ready, bond beam, leave, go to the next one. Then our hardscape crew comes in, coping, uh, hardscape, uh, you know, kind of do all that construction process of the project. And then we have a landscape crew that comes in and does all the final find, you know, and we find the people that like lighting, landscaping, that kind of stuff, like that detail stuff. That's, those are very specific people, I think. And they can come in behind us. And what it, I think what it does is creates a very efficient uh, 10 person company and me kind of standing at the top and managing and, and, uh, and helping process all that stuff and plan and do all that. And then, hopefully have an administrative person helping us do like permitting and ordering and paying bills and all that stuff. Uh, so I don't know if that's all going to happen in five years, but this year we're, you know, what that allows us to do too is say like, obviously we, if we, I think we can get more projects done that way for one, 
but I also think it also think it allows us to go set pools for other companies. It allows us to excavate for other companies uh, because that those two aspects aren't going to stay maybe in line with the hardscape or landscape uh, if we're big, on bigger projects. So that's kind of where I'm rolling. And I think I, I feel like it's a good plan. I think the guys are on board with it. And then, the, but it allows us to kind of hire as we need instead of just hire, throwing people at, at stuff. You know, yeah. if it works. So mm. I don't know. Just a just a thought. <laughs> hey, I love it, man. That that is fantastic. Um, so much I want to talk about here, but we're running running on time here. Uh, <laughs> what was the, the triaxle? What was the the game plan? That was a pretty significant investment, I imagine. And uh, you know, everybody secretly wants to be paver king. I think running a bunch of running a bunch of tri and quad axles around, maybe. But what uh, myself included, by the way, the uh, what what was the business plan or thought process with with such a big truck? So I actually messaged Paper King. I was like, talk me out of buying a 2023 Peterbilt. <laughs> <laughs> he goes, well, if you, if you love trucks, buy it. If you hate trucks, don't buy it. Like it's kind of one of the, I mean, I was, and, and it, it's so simple, but it's pretty good advice. And uh, unfortunately I love trucks. Um, <laughs> um, there's no hope for you. <laughs> we're trying to, you know, do we buy another one? Anyway, uh, so the, the plan, so what happened was we were digging all these pools and I was calling a, uh, I was calling our hauler and I was like, Hey, I'd use this hauler in my pre and Charlotte Auto landscape. We use this guy when we, we'd do a big like retaining wall or uh, excavate a patio or something like we have to haul a bunch of stuff off. I'd call them. We'd have a skid steer there. We'd load them, we'd drive off. So this time around, I noticed, you know, we'd say, okay, we need two triaxles or we need a triaxle, you know, depending on our access and space. So these trucks would show up and they had, they didn't have the name on the side from the company. It was somebody else's truck and it got my wheels spinning. And, uh, I was like, okay, we're paying six grand. We're paying like, it was like monthly. We were paying just ridiculous amounts of money to pay for hauling. And because we're haul we're moving so much material, but you know, by the time we bring stuff in from the quarry and we haul stuff away and, uh, clean up at the end of the job site, you know, so the international was helping, but it was just like, still, we needed something bigger. And so I called the, the guy we were, uh, haul that was doing our hauling. And I said, Hey, I noticed you're subbing out a lot of your work. I said, I've been considering looking for like a tandem or a triaxle and, and, uh, would you be able to help us keep it busy if on the days we didn't need it? And he goes, man, he goes, I'm running 60 trucks a day that aren't mine right now. Well, wow. I was like, yeah. He's like, we need all the help we can get. He goes, I don't care if it's a tandem axle, triaxle, an end dump, whatever you buy, we'll figure it out. And I just asked him like what the most, um, what the most used one was, you know, because it's different pay rates for each of them. Sure. And, uh, so it's not a super lucrative business. And that was one thing that Paver King said as well. It's, it's one of the least profitable things he does. Uh, but my thinking was let's buy this thing and we'll use it. And I, I, you know, the other challenge was finding, okay, finding a driver, finding a truck. So those are two big hurdles. I, so I, I, that's how I, this is another way I make purchase decisions is like find the work first, right? Like don't, I don't want to go buy something I don't have to work for and then have somebody that can do it. So, so I found the work and then I had a neighbor, uh, he had moved away, but we had talked a little bit and I knew he was a class A driver and I know he was, he would, we had talked in the spring of last year about him coming to maybe drive for us and help. And he wasn't super interested. So I was like, man, if I had a job where he just drove all the time, he, this may be his cup of tea. So, uh, I called him, he was working a ton of hours. It's, it was report. He was doing LTL reporting an hour away from home. Uh, so he would work 10, 12 hours a day plus his drive time. So and we knew, we knew them. So we had him over, uh, sat on the back patio him and his wife. And we, I, I laid out my plan. I said, I'm going to try to find a truck. Uh, and, and if you're interested, I'd like, you know, like to at least have a possibility that you'd think about it. And so, um, then I called and, you know, one of those, it's kind of a perfect storm where I called a, a, a truck company and I was looking for a, a used truck or somebody had traded something in. And he's like, no, but we have, a, you know, a guy just backed out of three brand new trucks there are, everything's already ordered. You can't make any changes, but there's one left, you know? And I was mm. like, okay. You know, so we, wow. I just took a chance, man. It, and, and then we got the driver and 
winter's been a little challenging because it's been super wet. Um, so that's something to think about is like when you have a full-time driver and, uh, you know, big truck payment and insurance payments and fuel bills and all that stuff you have to, um, so we're, we're kind of in a, you know, we make hay while the sun shines and we work, work, work on that truck. And then, you know, he'll get a day off here and there, but he's also been really good to help us on the crew this winter. Mm. And it also worked out to where we, we had this project where we hauled in a lot of limestone and we had, we probably hauled in, uh, three, 300 plus tons of gravel for a buildup around this pool we're doing. And so it worked out cause we used the truck a lot on the winter mm. project that we had and it's a separate company. So I bill, Sheller Outdoor Living for trucking, and I pay that company separately, and then we lease it from Sheller. But it's a, it's a complicated thing, but we did a lot of different yeah. things for liability issues and stuff. But, and just Man, keeping the awesome. money separate. But yeah. Man, that's awesome, Craig. The And by yeah. the way, folks, contact a triaxle or quad or whatever. It's, that's a dump truck. Something I didn't realize in one of our last podcasts, we kept talking about a K-Dub, and that's a Kenworth <laughs> dump truck. <laughs> Yeah, so, we have Peter Peterbilt, but yeah. Oh, you're Pete yeah. guy. Look out. So uh, it was, that's um, what was available. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay, gotcha. Okay. By 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 proxy, then at least. But uh, the other the other I'm sorry. But the other fine. freedom. The other part about that is though is like, I already had my class A, so I know too that if that if my driver leaves for some reason, I can jump in that truck and drive. And cover it. it. And that's not something I I want to do, but in a pinch or even like he gets you know a couple weeks vacation every year or whatever. I'm gonna. I'll jump in that truck and have a little fun, or we'll just park sure. the week. It doesn't really matter. But I, I know that that truck's not gonna sit if I don't have a driver, um, and we can make it work. And the, the, the plan is part of my five year plan is that truck will be paid for in four to five years, and it'll be mine, and we yeah. can use it however we want to at that point. So it's, it's kind yeah. of a long. It was a long game for me in a, in a break even situation probably as we're paying for it. But as long as I'm not paying a bunch of money to support it, uh, I think it's a, I think it's a good long term move for me yeah that's awesome craig um well outside of this stuff uh you've got a podcast backyard conversations correct and then craig yes. Schiller music tell us about all that <laughs> stuff. well uh yeah so we're uh we're trying to do uh basically with through the podcast i'm just trying to kind of uh bring some of the people from my network in either from my long t- time in the career people i respect in the industry um people that are they're making a difference in my career right now and also like vendors and uh, people that have supported me through my career. So I'm just pulling some of those people in to kind of give an introduction to why I'm partnered with those people. Um, and, and I think that it's, you know, I try to do it in a really low key, like, you know, just having a conversation and nothing's really super, it's pretty informal. Um, but I'm, I'm also, I'm just trying to be like, uh, as I've kind of progressed, I've realized that, you know, it's, you know, it gets hard to cover a lot of things. So like, like, you know, I had Jeremy on, we, we talked just about technology, you know, or like they kind of do more topic specific things because it's, there's so many broad things you can talk about. Um, so I'm just trying to get, you know, I just had my lighting rep on, uh, you know, and then, then other contractors, you know, like I had pride, Evan with pride on, we talked specifically about equipment and employee retention, like, and so, you know, so we're just, there's a lot of different, like, we're just trying to take a little bit different approach, I guess, and just uh, anything I can do to give back, kind of like you're doing, just want to give back to the industry and, and uh, offer any, any insight, like, I don't have it all figured out, but if I can share my mistakes or my wins with people and, and have them learn so the future of hardscaping and construction can be alive when I'm gone, I think that's an important thing, so. Awesome. Heck yeah. And then still taking a stage here and there. Uh, yeah, I don't have as much planned as I have in the past, but I'm pretty busy trying to make a living. <laughs> yeah, all right. Yeah, yeah. The, Getting the way the music, all the fun stuff done. The here. music, uh, we were at track last, track meet last night, and the guy guy there goes, hey, did you uh, run track when you were in high school? Because my kids are running. I was like, no, I played guitar. And he goes, oh, that's probably pretty good. And I was like, yeah, I made a whole lot more money playing guitar than I had running. <laughs> and uh, and I said, and I haven't made much playing guitar. <laughs> no, I was going to say, <laughs> ah, that was the fall <laughs> That's what I always yeah. hear anyways. Um, yeah. Well, well, Craig, man, we're at an hour. Good God. I, I could go another hour or two at least. But uh, yeah. Uh, where can folks, I meant to say this earlier, where can folks find you and check out all this awesome stuff you're doing? Uh, so we're, uh, Instagram is what we kind of our daily stuff uh, at Sheller Outdoor Living. And then the podcast is, I did a separate uh, Instagram on there. So it's backyard.conversations. 
Um, and then we're, we do have a YouTube channel. Uh, the podcast can be found everywhere and on uh, YouTube as well. And then we do have a Sheller Outdoor Living YouTube channel. Um, we've kind of been documenting the project we're on now uh, uh, this year because it started in January and it's just a kind of an interesting project. So I've been kind of documenting the different stages of that. We have a few equipment videos and things like that. We'll kind of update that with our new GPS system, kind of show people what we're doing, what we're using. That's kind of where that content goes. Um, and then kind of our processes. And then um, and then uh, we're on Facebook too, uh, but I don't do a, a ton on Facebook, just a little bit. So there's nothing, there's, there's never nothing to do, right? Right. <laughs> it's always uh, busy. <laughs> yeah. There's always a million things to do. Well, Craig, thanks so much, man, for your time today. I really appreciate that and uh, yeah. what you're doing for the industry and with the industry and, and uh, adapt into the tech and change and all. I think it's really, I think it's really cool. And that's one of the things that definitely sets you apart from, from a lot of other contractors. So uh, I definitely admire the heck out of that. Um, I appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, man. So uh, thanks again for being on and from the company cam studios, the kid contractor podcast podcast. God, what a mess this is. I'm in a big hurry. <laughs> I'm under the gun here, Craig. I got that. We've got <laughs> some training starting tomorrow and, and oh, yeah. there's yeah. nowhere near ready for to come in and I'm like stressing over that. So I think that's maybe. Hey, one hey, you can record your outro later. I know how it works. <laughs> <laughs> the folks from the Kid Contractor Podcast, Company Cam Studios here at Craig Scheller. Scheller Outdoor Living. Go check him out on all that stuff he's got going there. Uh, we appreciate you checking in. We'll catch you on the next one, folks. We'll see you. Awesome, Craig. Thank you.